Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Here today with your hosts, Lisa and Venkat. Hey, Venkat, how's it going? Hey, Lisa. Things are going well. That's good. So today and we're going to... Yeah, we're going letter... to talk about the letter M, right? Yeah, letter M today. Um, yes. What's our topic going to be, Venkat? Well, the first topic that's on my mind is the Mars rover. So a new Mars rover is going to land on... Uh, Mars this week on Thursday, the NASA Perseverance rover. Oh. And um, there was actually a Mars uh, mission last week from the UAE. So the first tiny country to send a Mars mission, it's called the HOPE mission. So it's oh. an orbiter. So oh. that's two. And I think China is sending a rover uh, sometime around this time as well. And the ESA is sending one next year. So Mars rover shit is heating up and lunar rovers are also heating up. So moon, Mars, all the M's are getting rovers now. <laughs> yeah yeah that sounds like a great topic amazon martian mars didn't oh so didn't the united states have a mars rover that died recently like it was kind of a sad like got yeah, lost yeah that was um opportunity i think uh, so opportunity. so the mars rover program has had like uh, several generations now so the first generation was the sojourner so that was i think 1997 so it was small mm -hmm. it was like about as big as a small lawnmower okay then they went up to the Spirit and Curiosity missions, those were like 2007 to 11 or something. And those were, I would say, golf cart sized maybe. And these were also solar powered. So Sojourner and Spirit and Opportunity were all solar powered. And the one that's active now, which is Curiosity, that's nuclear powered. Wow, uh, so really? That, yeah, that one's as big as um, like a large SUV. It weighs a ton. And it, it had to have like a special way to land and stuff. Uh, and the new one that's going on this week, uh, Perseverance, is also going to be nuclear powered. So basically the problem is once you get past a certain size, the power requirements are so much that at uh, the distance of Mars, you can't really run it on um, solar power. You have so, to go nuclear. So speaking of like distances, um, the how far like so are these why are they making them bigger like the well you you want to carry more scientific equipment uh, mm -hmm. so um, the first few they were like sojourner was just trying it out like figuring out if we can do this at all then curious uh, spirit and opportunity were sort of relatively small look around take photographs kind of rovers mm -hmm. Uh, Curiosity was um, had some high power equipment. It had a drill. It could drill down, take chemical samples, uh, shit like that. Hmm. And uh, this one, uh, Perseverance, it's supposed to, I think, land in a crater. So all of these, the main mission has been like wander around, look for signs of life. So they're doing more and more of that. So this one is going to look for life in sort of a large crater. Hmm. And it's actually going to take core samples that will then be prepared um, for a future mission to come and take the samples back. So it has more range, more endurance, more uh, higher power equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh yeah, the, the power plants that they use, I, I say nuclear, but they're not nuclear <coughs> as in fission or fusion reactions. It's just a pile of radioactive material that's hot. And then you attach a thermocouple to it. So thermocouples are basically, you have like an electrical potential across a temperature difference. So you hold two terminals at different temperatures you get a power current across. It's extremely inefficient. So yeah, this was, this surprised me. So uh, let me actually share like uh, five interesting things I learned about Curiosity, which mm, is okay. on Mars, uh, because uh, with the Yacht Collective, we are trying to do a Mars rover design project. So a lot of us have been studying and figuring stuff out. So oh, first fine. interesting thing about the Curiosity rover is that it's extremely inefficient power-wise. So the uh, what's called the... I forget the MMRTG, so uh, radio thermal generator, that's what it's called. So it's plutonium and the heat it generates is approximately 2000 watts, but the thermocouple conversion efficiency is so low that uh, in the beginning of, uh, before the DK had progressed, it was generating about 110 watts, mm -hmm. so 5%. So it's like 5% conversion efficiency and it takes about 50 watts to keep the robot even remotely alive. Uh, so what ends up happening is you have 100 watts of power, 1900 watts have to be radiated away, which is not that hard because Mars is cold and empty. Hmm. And uh, the 100 watts is used to charge a battery because if you're actually moving, it costs about 500 watts to move the rover. So that ends up meaning that you sit 
around in sunlight charging for a long time and then you get a solar day and the rest of the time you have to sit around charging. Mm. So that's my first interesting fact that it's so inefficient. Oh, the same nuclear power technology is used on um, far um, like uh, missions like uh, Cassini, which went to Saturn. So Jupiter has the Juno mission, which runs on solar power, but Cassini, because certain Saturn is a little farther away and the solar power is too low, it runs on this nuclear technology and everything that has gone farther out. So New Horizons, Voyager, Pioneer, all of them use uh, radio thermal uh, nuclear uh, power plants. So it's basically, it's, it, those, that, those are the only two ways you can power space missions right now, solar and uh, radio thermal nuclear. So that was my first uh, interesting fact. Uh, I'll just do three, five might be too many. I, I don't know that I can think of five. The second most interesting fact is that the wheels on um, Curiosity, they're milled from a solid block of aluminum mm, okay. and they're just 0.75 millimeter thick. So this shocked me. So there's no tires or anything. It's just 0.75 millimeter thick. So like, uh, you know, like not hair's breadth, but extremely thin, like a few sheets of paper, it's that thin. And apparently, partly it was like just to get the weight down. So uh, it's it's this thin aluminum shell, but there's like ribs that are more like six millimeter thick. Mm -hmm. But uh, partly it was just getting the weight down and they thought the stiff design would do the trick. Partly it was kind of a mistake because they didn't realize that the terrain would be as rough as it turned out to be. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems that's been limiting the Curiosity mission, it's now like what, uh, 10 years almost. Curiosity was, I think 2011 or no, 2013, I don't know, seven to 10 years. I don't know how long it's been. But they thought that the limiting factor would be the nuclear generator running down. So because it's a radio, a radioactive decay, it's gonna be get, get less and less powerful over time. Mm -hmm. So when it gets below 50 watts output, which will happen about 15 to 20 years, there's not enough to even keep it like marginally alive. So they thought that would be the limiting factor. But turns out other things broke first, like the wheels, they're getting degraded and now they have to be very careful. Otherwise the wheels will degrade to the point till it can't move at all. Mm. And then it'll become like a hunk of rock. It'll get bricked. And uh, I think one of the things they've done a lot of changes is uh, they've redesigned the wheel. So this has been one of the interesting challenges because the lunar rover, which the Apollo astronauts drove around that had some weird wire mesh kind of wheel. The Mars yeah. rovers have this. And the reason they can't use like inflated rubber or something is that rubber turns into basically brittle glass-like substances at uh, that low temperature. You can't do rubber wheels. So it's actually a very difficult challenge. And mm. you kind of literally have to reinvent the wheel, which kind of like cracks me up that you have to reinvent the wheel to go to Mars. All right, so the last fact I'll do is the probably the most dramatically interesting thing about the Perseverance rover, which is roughly like the Curiosity rover in design, but they've made several updates. But the biggest kind of like fun update is it's carrying a helicopter. So it's gonna be the first rover that launches a helicopter on another planet, which is, uh, I actually didn't realize this was possible because I did like some quick back of the envelope calculations back when I was getting started thinking about this. And I was like, um, the Mars atmosphere is too thin to sustain the kind of lift you need to run a um, uh, helicopter, even though on the flip side, it has lower gravity. So it's a trade-off between those two things, like very thin air versus very low gravity. So it looks like they found a way to do a design that actually works. Huh. So that will be interesting. We'll get imagery from a uh, uh, helicopter flying around a rover. So those are my three interesting facts. When about you say rover. helicopter, you mean drone, right? Uh yeah, drone. As in like a rotor, a rotor drone, so not fixed wing. I yeah, I don't think you could do fixed wing on Mars. The atmosphere is probably- What's the difference big. between fixed wing and rotor? Oh, rotorcraft is helicopters. So anything with a fan-like thing that's spinning yeah. on top. So drones, uh, the most popular drones these days have like the quad uh, quadcopter for a configuration, mm -hmm. four rotors, because it's like simple, easy, and with like lithium ion and Arduino kind of electronics and power, things become light enough that you can do that. Like this was not possible 15, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. but now batteries and uh, electronics have gotten light enough. Fixed wing is regular planes, like, you know, 737s or like a commercial flight you might take. They work on different principles. Um, yeah, so. I see, where, yeah. I see. Most drones are not fixed wing. Uh, most hobby or most consumer hobby drones. drones. 
but okay. most military drones are fixed wing. Right. So yep. Predator and Global Hawk and all those military drones that you know shoot missiles at terrorists, they tend to be fixed wing because they have like much higher range. They're much more efficient. They can fly much faster. They can carry a higher payload. I mean, they're basically like planes without a driver yeah. drone yeah. style thing. You can there- kind of mix them up. Have you ever seen an Osprey? So Os- an Osprey is uh, one of the rare tilt rotor um, aircraft. It has like airplane like wings, but the wings have like two engine propellers, but they can tilt. So it, like in normal flight, they face forward like a regular plane, but then they can tilt and become a two rotor helicopter. So it can like take off and land vertically and stuff. That's cool. Okay. So that's yeah. my that's fact cool. for Mars rovers. And I want to show one more thing. Yeah. This is part of the Mars rover I'm designing. I think oh. I showed this once before, did I? No, I've never seen it. What is so it? This it's is like a 3D a, printed. Uh, yeah, it's 3D printed. A and mobile. This is one side of a six wheel design, which all the Mars rovers use called a rocker bogey. Mm. So this two wheel part is called the bogey, and then this other wheel is called the rocker. Mm. And this is very good at like uh, crossing terrain. So a typical like car like vehicle can typically go over an obstacle about half the height of the wheel. Mm-hmm. So like uh, your typical car is like what, maybe a, a foot and a half or two feet sized wheels. So it can maybe do like uh, 12 inch obstacles. Yeah. Whereas something like, um, so you can, it can climb up a curb with a yep. uh, typical car wheel. Yep. Whereas a uh, Mars rover type wheel design, it can uh, get up obstacles up to twice the size of the wheel. It oh, just fascinating. Lines up. So this kind of, um, wheel design or undercarriage design mm-hmm. can basically climb staircases and stuff. So much taller than itself. Interesting. Yep. So that's where we are with Mars Robots, exciting stuff. When are we sending a Boston Dynamics uh, spot dog to Mars? That would be interesting. So in the Yak Collective, we are doing the Yak Rover project. So the way we decided to do it is mm-hmm. whoever wants to sign up to do like a, a personal sized project build just do it. So I'm trying to do the six wheel design, basically copying NASA, but a couple of other people on the team, they're doing spider designs. Mm -hmm. So they've um, bought like off the shelf spider robot things and they're like programming it and stuff. So I think, yeah, at some point, somebody will send legged uh, robot designs. Though, if you actually do the trade-off space, unless you're doing something really special, like climbing a complicated mountain with lots of uh, boulders and stuff, the advantages of wheeled robots are like way higher. So interesting. we'll see. Interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. I also wonder if the, um, the, the Boston Dynamic robots are heavier probably, like the amount of machinery it takes to get that kind of like articulation is not as quite uh, efficient. As it, it depends. It, it, depends because motors and battery power have gotten so much more efficient. Mm. It totally depends on how you design it because uh, ultimately it's down to like torques and gear ratios and stuff like um, a joint, like an arm or something. Mm -hmm. So knee joint, for example, you would just gear down a motor extremely so that you get a lot more torque um, at joint and then you can, you have like locomotion. It won't be as efficient. You'll get like uh, poorer range and stuff. I see. But I, think you could make legged robots like basically as uh, like power to weight ratios, like a typical metric you use for things like this. Mm-hmm. So I think you can get similar power to weight ratios for good leg designs as you can for good wheel designs. Interesting. Hmm. That's yeah. really interesting. So what made you interested in this Mars Rover, Rover stuff? Like how did you guys at the yeah, Collective decide this is what you wanted to focus on. Also, we should probably talk about what the Yak Collective is. For oh, yeah, I think I've more. mentioned it a couple of times before. So it's, uh, it's basically a Discord server and a Rome website right now. It's, it's a bunch of independent consultants like doing projects together, trying to go after gigs together. So one of our premises is as small robots become more and more sort of important in day to day life, like, you know, you've got scooters, you've got delivery robots. So that sector was heating up. It's going to be a fun sector to get into and maybe do consulting in. Mm-hmm. And um, personally, the way I got started was I got into all this hobby maker stuff and I needed like some sort of uh, big capstone project to work towards that pull together everything like electronics, 3D printing, mechanical design. And it seemed like starting a Mars rover would be a fun thing to try. And then I sort of posted the idea in the Yak Collective and a bunch of other people said they're interested too. So we all decided to start. So right now, by the way, for those interested, we have 
regular weekly meetings on Monday night specific time where we basically take turns talking about aspects of rover design. And hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have a whole bunch of uh, little toy rovers to show off. So that's the Yuck Collective and why we are doing rover design. So whenever you, after you've designed your um, your rover, is it going to be able to drive? Are you going to be able to remote control it, drive it around? Yeah. So one of the other team members um, is uh, already doing that. So he's one of the guys doing the spider stuff. Mm -hmm. And he's already set it up to a remote server. So he hasn't given public access yet. But within the team, those of us who have access with private keys, we can SSH in and control his rover. So it's okay. sitting somewhere in Japan in his office. Oh, I see. So I was gonna, okay, so that was my next question is, what kind of terrain are you guys practicing on? Do you have like a, a course that you go and try it out on when you, you know, you get oh, your design um, together? None of us is that far along yet. Mm -hmm. The spider guys are farthest along because they're using an off-the-shelf one. Mm -hmm. I'm at the level where I'm still designing my wheels. Mm -hmm. uh, does, uh, for those who are interested in this, uh, there's actually free open source design. So JPL has an open source uh, rover design that's very much like the Mars rovers. And the build cost is about $2,500. So you can get the complete downloaded plans for the mechanical electrical compute systems, mm. buy about $2,500 worth of parts and build your own rover that's pretty close to the Mars rover. And the ESA, which hasn't yet successfully sent a rover, they have their own open source design as well, which is about 500 euros. So depending on how ESA? much- ESA? Uh, European Space Agency. So it's the uh, yeah, EU's NASA. Mm, I see, interesting. Yeah, so there's like huge, if you go on YouTube, there's a huge number of people who've built their own rovers and like show it off. So it's like, it's a thing now, like building your own rovers. Like I didn't realize it. It's a whole community of people building rovers. Man, speaking yeah. of Mars, I've been watching this TV show, The Expanse. Um, have you seen, it's in, I think it's on, not Netflix, it's on. It's Netflix on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just yeah, wrapped up. Like I started watching it a couple of months ago and mm. just caught up with the newest episodes and finished. It's, yeah, I love it. Uh, yeah, I'm on. I'm almost through season four, so I just started it recently. And in it, so for those of you who are listening who aren't familiar, it's a TV show that's sci-fi, and it kind of depicts a solar system where there's a colony on Mars. Um, so America, well, America, people from Earth have gone to Mars and colonized it, and have been there for several generations. And so long that Mars has had its war for independence and broken free, and now has its own independent, like world nation, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's kind of. And cool. there's the Belters. Don't forget the Belters. So it's like a three-way sort of it's political three struggle between Earth, Mars, and everybody in the asteroid belt who are kind of the underclass. Oh, uh, speaking they're of miners, that, right? They're like that. Yeah, they're miners. Miners, yeah. And uh, they ha they're reliant on Earth for like basically all organics and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, and they're much weaker. But um, interesting thing, um, the language, the Belter language that uh, they speak, it's actually a real kind of made up language. And I was asking about it on Twitter, and somebody pointed me to the Twitter account of the guy who made up the language, so the mm -hmm. linguist. So it's it's quite fascinating. Like they actually put serious thought into making the language. I thought it was just like give these people a Caribbean accent and you're done. But no, they've like actually thought it through. Yeah, I really hate. I think the thing about Belter, the, the Belter speaking that bothers me when I watch it is that I feel like they all sort of have different accents. Um, so they say the same stuff, but I don't know. Their accent really bugs me. I don't know why. Yeah. It's like, it just doesn't, I don't know. I mean, that takes, like apparently the actors who have to speak Belter they were uh, uh, they they went through like accent training like like a word a day kind of stuff like every day they'd have to like practice saying a word in the Belter way, yeah. so I guess some of them are better actors than others and pick it up in sort of a good way and others are crappy. Yeah, I feel like I do. I just I feel like they sort of all have a different like one of them sounds a little British when they say it the others sound a little more Scottish or something like it's just kind of a but I guess you could make a whole story that like the belt is like a very spread out place right and the um it's true of like it's possible uh, like, that they'd all have different dialects of a different of I mean this is true of like all places on earth as well like uh, we were going to talk about uh, the weather in Texas so this is a good oh, segue yeah. point like <laughs> before I came to the U.S. the Texan accent was the only sort of 
regional American accent that I recognized besides basic American. Like for me in India, I could recognize the American accent and then the Texan American accent. Mm. And now that I've lived here more than 20 years, I can recognize a few more. I still don't have a strong ear for it, but I can tell like, you know, Boston and New York and mm. general sort of Midwestern, apart from like the basic Southern drawl versus, I think I can tell Texan apart a little bit. Texas but when I lived in Texan, Texas for a year, Austin people don't speak like the sort of hick rural Texan. There's just several language. different accents in Texas. There's like okay, so very... uh, what I'm are not... they? What are the different Texas accents? I wouldn't accents? say that I'm super familiar with them, but I think there's there's like a north east kind of Dallas. What's the name of? There's like a town up there that you would call it. It's not Lubbock. It's not Lubbock. Lubbock's West Texas. There's a West Texas rancher accent. Um, Laredo. Huh. Laredo. Is it Laredo you're thinking of? Of Laredo? No. Oh, okay. All right. So there's that accent in Dallas. There's like the Dallas kind of accent. And then down here in the South, we kind of have more of a, we get closer to like Louisiana. So more of a Southern proper, proper antebellum Southern accent, Mm -hmm. the closer you get towards Louisiana. Um, so we have a little bit of a different thing. And then I think you're right, like Hill Country, like Austin sounds a little different also. Austin sounded like generic urban American for the most part, I guess, because there were so many uh, like non-Texans there. So that's part of it. In Austin, yeah. yeah. But your accent is basically now generic American, right? Are there any Texan remnants left in how you speak i have a fake accent that i can put on would you like to hear my fake texas yes i would accent? like to hear um, so why don't you tell us about the weather in texas right now the big snowstorm in the texan accent. in the texas accent all right give me a let me let me see if i can do this sometimes it's hit or miss um let's see y'all uh we're having uh we're having a big snowstorm down here right now um snowstorms are real weird for texas i don't know how much y'all know about um weather in texas but it doesn't usually get this cold down here especially not in february um so uh we got a couple inches of snow here in houston this morning um my i got family who lives out in austin um and they are under six inches of snow and have no power have not had power since 6 a.m this morning and are getting real cold uh last i heard from them they were trying to uh, defrost some wood to put in the fireplace because it's only going to get colder tonight. Um, I'm actually real lucky here in Houston. Uh, most of my family doesn't have power here either. And it's, uh, it's getting colder. It's, we hit like 26 degrees Fahrenheit this afternoon and it's going to get down to the teens overnight. So, uh, I don't know, man, people down here, we're not used (laughs) to it. We can't, we can't handle this kind of cold. Ah, that's pretty good. I, I can tell that code switching between Texan and regular is uh, a thing for you. But uh, that sounds closest to George Bush's accent uh, from what I can tell. Like George Bush used to speak vaguely like that. Yeah, He's that's because Houston, George right? Bush also has a fake Texas accent. <laughs> uh, Correct. Yes. Yeah. Correct. His is definitely put on. It's maintained. He has a maintained Texas accent. Okay. His is much more sort of uh, consistent. Yours, it was like slipping back and forth even within a single sentence. So that was funny. Uh, But yeah, the weather is uh, like the one year I lived there in 2000, I think the second week after I landed there, there was a big ice storm and a huge number of accidents in Austin because nobody knew how to drive in the ice. No one knows how to drive in it. And like, I was kind of laughing. I got new tires for my car. Hang on, it's going to take me a second to hop out of the Texan vocal <laughs> pattern. Um, I uh, I got new tires for my car last October, and I ended up buying the ones that were best rated for wet pavement because that makes sense in Houston. It rains a lot here; we get a lot of water. But they also happen to be all season tires, so they they're rated for snow and ice um, as well. My dad, when he found out what kind of tires I got, he was like, he kind of was like, you know, we don't need those. We only need summer winter summer tires here in Texas. This is really all you need. Um, so I think that gives you, I mean, some people do have like tires that don't work in winter. Like that's what you buy. Cause we don't ever get like roads that have ice on them. Except huh. when, I don't know. So the other thing about this, the other thing that I think not enough people are really acknowledging. Well, some people are, some people aren't, 
about this cold snap is that the reason we have cold air down here is because it broke off from the North Pole and floated down this way. And we should not be having this whole, this uh, cold air shouldn't have come down this far. Like, this is this is really weird it's weird it's definitely like yeah. if you look at satellite photos of the united states it obviously looks like a patch of cold air that broke off of something and fell fell off the top and like that shouldn't have happened um it's been other than this like incredible cold snap it's been really like warm so it's not like we've had a really unseasonably cold winter it's that some air escaped from the igloo and made its way down places it shouldn't be um which is definitely like a global warming thing or what do we call it climate change seems to be the better um, yep. thing for it oh the rolling power outages is new too we've never had that before isn't that due to like the wind power uh, factor like you can't like i read something about the wind turbines being frozen and yeah. so you can't do the load management that you're expected to yeah, so my understanding is that the, the right, so normally we'd have more wind turbines rolling than our, um, I, I saw, I've been seeing conflicting things. Some people are like, well, they managed to heat them back up. Um, I feel like I might be kind of making this up now, but um, a while ago I was talking to a friend about they can make, they can make wind turbines that have heaters built into the top into the heads where the stuff is so they stay warm in the winter because they have wind turbines up in like what scotland or wherever mm -hmm. like they have them in cold climate places and they run them in cold climate places i would be highly surprised if they spent the extra money to add the heaters to the ones that they installed in texas Probably not. Oh, speaking of which, I thought of a fourth interesting thing about the Mars rovers since you brought it up. <laughs> the motors take a couple of hours every morning to heat up. So every Martian morning, wow. it takes a couple of hours. So initially they had it programmed where the uh, rover would wake up and start heating and would be able to do nothing for a couple of hours while the motors were heating up. Mm. And then they decided that was inefficient and they came up with like an updated operating system that basically put the rover in what they call a dreaming state, oh. which is it kind of wakes up just enough to start the motor heating mm. and then kind of vaguely goes back to sleep. And when the motors are ready, it actually wakes up and starts its day. So huh. yeah, it's kind of interesting that extreme um, climates and terrains, you kind of have to think of lots of weird shit that you don't normally have to think about don't normally like, think yeah about. i was looking at the motors for example the motors for the mars rovers are made with uh, by a company called maxon mm -hmm. so maxon is a well-known like high-end motor maker mm -hmm. uh, back when i used to do lab work our lab had maxon motors mm -hmm. uh, but they had to actually they took some standard motors but then they had to redesign it with like special lubricant because the regular lubricant would freeze on mars so yeah how cold does it get on mars how far away are we from martian freezing temperatures here or it gets way colder, like it'll be like way colder than Earth Arctic temperatures. But okay. uh, yeah, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. it's extremely cold. Yeah, that's really cold. That's really, yeah. really cold. Yeah, I mean, it is a different planet much cold. farther away. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, it's, Texas is having a terrible time right now on a whole. Alien landscapes, alien environments, you know, like when you get, uh, when you end up with, um, it sounds like, I mean, it's so like the Mars rover stuff. It sounds like they're, they plan for that stuff, right? Like you're saying they take a motor they already have and they figure out what the temperatures are and then figure out what they have is going to freeze. And so they plan and design and create yep. a new motor that will work in that environment, right? Uh, I think this is the problem with climate change is that it's changing what we know is normal. So a lot of our built infrastructure here in Texas, like, isn't this like, this is like legitimately alien alien mm. environment that we've all been subjected to like i don't know i'm really worried about people without power because i have a lot of warm clothes and like sweaters and stuff here in houston but that's because i lived in new york city for a couple of years and like you have to buy all that warm stuff mm -hmm. most people don't have wool socks or like warm underclothes or mm -hmm. like you know long johns kind of stuff um and there's like yeah don't have like you know, the heat goes out, but we don't have fireplaces either everywhere. So I don't know, it's cold. Yeah, it's uh, like one of the interesting, um, 
ideas I've heard is that terraforming is an idea that needs to be applied to Earth first. So the idea of terraforming is you take another alien planet and make it like Earth. Yeah. There's like science fiction based on that premise. Like, yeah, expanse. The expanse, they're like basically doing kinds of terraforming. Mm-hmm. Um, I started reading Kim Stanley Robinson's uh, novel called Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. It's a trilogy. Mm-hmm. It's not that much fun, but yeah, it's about terraforming of Mars. Oh, uh, cool. okay. But the terraforming of Earth. So uh, Benjamin Bratton, who wrote the book, The Stack, has another short ebook called Terraforming. Mm-hmm. So it's like looking at uh, Earth itself through the lens of terraforming. And I think that's exactly right. Like uh, uh, other examples I can think of is Seattle. When we moved there, everybody told us you don't need air conditioning here. It never gets that hot. And if you look back at historical temperatures, that was true. But for us, it was like, we were told by longtime residents that maybe a couple of days in August, it'll get that hot. But when we were living there for like six years, it was like three or four weeks every year. And the number of days that needed air conditioning was just going up and up. So it's no longer the case that Seattle does not need air conditioning. And I think you'll see similar, like like uh, my, uh, my parents live in Coimbatore in Southern India, and it's been the coldest, wettest winter slash, uh, they have a winter monsoon uh, mm-hmm. season ever. And there people are struggling because like in Texas, they don't have like cold weather clothes. So the yeah. houses here leak air, like nobody's business, like the <laughs> older ones. Like, I don't know, I've been running around with a roll of packing tape, taping up my windows. Um, so you kind of have to do terraforming off earth, like starting with whatever, like your own home environment, like suddenly you have to weatherize it against alien environments. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, oh, and speaking of weather, since we're connecting to Mars, everything we are talking about, uh, <laughs> I just remembered the reason the previous rover, the opportunity had to shut down was this, there was this huge, huge dust storm. So Mars has these sort of periodic like planet sized dust storms that last for months on end. So one of these dust storms started up, I think sometime, I keep forgetting years, a few years back. And um, it was, I think it went from like June to September or something. And so basically the solar panels couldn't charge. And at some point um, the power ran low enough that you couldn't run the basic clock circuits even required to like uh, wake the rover up and stuff. So at that point, the rover kind of like just gave up and died. So it was like weather, Martian weather killed the rover. Alien environments, Dan, yeah. Like, environments, yeah. So that's M, Mars and alien weathers and weird dialects and Lisa doing a Texan accent very badly. Hey. <laughs> As well as George okay. Bush, as well as W. I'll take that. All right. Close to George W. All right. All right. See you next week, Lisa. All right. Always a pleasure, Venkat. Take care. Thanks. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, We're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Great. Um, And if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.